Hi, and thank you for welcoming us into your moment this evening or this afternoon. We are ISARC, Interfaith Social Assistance Reform Coalition. We are deeply concerned as a faith community, the sons and daughters of Abrahamic faith, about poverty, about homelessness, deeply concerned about food in the budget, and we are concerned especially about the recent budget presented to us by the Ontario government. We are concerned because very little is there for those on the margins of society, the less fortunate, the downtrodden, the broken, the wounded. A society is judged to be human to the degree that it looks after the less fortunate ones. To help us in our presentation today and in our discussion with you, inviting you to think along with us, and hopefully at the end of this little moment, to do something about it, we've invited Michael Skelgen, who is the newly appointed director of ISARC. We also have, next to Michael, Colleen Sim, who's the executive director and a lawyer of the Hamilton, of the Hamilton Halton Community sorry, Legal Services. And then on the end, we have Michael Abdul Rashid Taylor, who is the director of the Islamic Chaplaincy Services of Canada. So be, to begin our little conversation, I would like, Michael, if you could please just give us a sense of ISARC, what it's about, and what we hope to do in the coming year. Sure. Well, ISARC has been around actually for about 25 years, and uh, so we originated in 1986, and a lot of where we come from, and as you mentioned in our name, ISARC stands for Interfaith Social Assistance Reform Coalition, and so our roots really uh, were helping the provincial government uh, back in 1986 to review the social assistance program. So back in 1986, the province put together a review committee, uh, which they have now again, in 2011 they put together, and they pulled together a subcommittee of interfaith uh, people to be able to give our perspective on reviewing the social assistance program. And so once that program, that review was finished, the small group or collective decided to continue. They felt that there was some merit that the faith communities had been brought together, perhaps some, it was a virtuous opportunity to take care of, our auspicious opportunity to take care of and see how we can continue that agenda and move it forward to mobilize the faith communities in action against poverty. And so really we've been quite busy for the last 25 years and our main focus here isn't so much about providing the physical programs that help people with their direct needs, but making sure that we take it to the next level, to the political level, and we can advocate for the proper public policy reform so that those changes can be made in place for the system mm -hmm. so it can be improved to better assist people. The question, Michael, might be raised, why are faith communities concerned about poverty? Right. Why are faith communities concerned about the homeless, about food in the budget? We are an interfaith group. For 25 years, we've been interfaith, but primarily Judeo-Christian. You are a Tibetan Buddhist. We have with us Michael, who is Muslim. Michael, why, in your perspective, are the faith communities concerned about poverty, about homelessness, about food in the budget? All traditions, you know, not only Islam, but all faith traditions does have, do have concerns for the marginalized in their societies. Um, my own tradition, Islam, has a, a, a legal expectation of the poor to take care, the, the rich to take care of the poor. There's a tax on one's wealth that yearly that goes towards the poor. You know, charitable giving, etc., is is directed to the poor. So we have a, a legal responsibility that translates into a moral responsibility for taking care of the poor and taking care of the neighbor. You know, there's one tradition where the Prophet Muhammad is, is reported to have said that the believer cannot go to sleep. Or how can one be a believer when one goes to sleep with one's stomach full and knows that your neighbor is hungry? And the neighbor is not just another Muslim, 
the neighbor is everyone, everyone the neighbor is everyone yeah, in our society yeah, yeah, yeah. so we have a, a, a very uh, we have a call to respond to to the poor and the needy within our tradition sure. that is that is that is concretized in our religious expectation yeah. and practice yeah. you know it's interesting you make me think of an interesting little moment that I learned in my faith journey St. Teresa of Avila said once to a person who was deep in mystical prayer and today we have a cry for spirituality in our culture a more hesitancy to find that spirituality in institutions Teresa of Avila said if you are in the moment of a mystical prayer and a knock comes to the door from a beggar go to the door because the God of the beggar is truer than the God of your mystical prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Colleen, you were involved in the audit. ISARC produced a book. Michael, maybe if you could just present for us the book. This is the result of an audit that was done in Ontario in varied groups throughout the province. This particular audit was concerned with those who are the victimized ones of our culture and society, and really the recipients of the government's lack of response in many ways. Colleen, you were part of that audit. You learned and saw much. Could you share with us just a little moment of what you picked up, and what, in a way, personally animated you to be part of this? I'm the executive director of the Halton Community Legal Services. We're a, a community legal clinic funded by Legal Aid Ontario to provide poverty law services in our region. The region of Halton is one of the most affluent in the country, let alone in the province. And very often what we find is in uh, initiatives, uh, Halton is skipped over. So at the legal clinic, we felt very strongly that we would like to partner with ISARC and ensure that uh, the voices of those living in poverty in Halton were heard as part of the larger provincial initiative. And the approach that we took in Halton as a community partner was that we wanted to have cross-sector, cross-community representation in the rapporteurs. And of course, in the audit process, the rapporteurs were community leaders who devoted their time and gave the gift of their time and uh, their passion and interest in social justice issues to spend the day in Halton listening to the stories and the voices of those living in poverty. So in Halton, we were assisted uh, by four rapporteurs. Uh, Bishop Michael Bird of the Anglican Diocese of uh, Niagara mm -hmm. represented the faith communities. We had a gentleman from Burlington, a businessman, Mark Hamel, uh, who represented that particular community. Director Joyce C. from Halton Region and Community Health Services represented that aspect. And we also had a curriculum developer from the Halton District School Board. So those four uh, community leaders, each within uh, their field as leaders, uh, listened to the stories of people living and experiencing poverty in Halton. Mm -hmm. Would you, Colleen, have a specific story that our viewers might like to hear as a result of the audit done in your area? We had uh, opportunities to hear from 15 people, and because of the stigma that people experience when they live in poverty, we arranged for each to have a private opportunity with the rapporteurs to tell their story. The stories of two women in particular uh, struck us all. Uh, uh, two women, uh, approximately the same age, one woman uh, had recently been informed that she and her daughter were going to be uh, recipients of a Habitat for Humanity home. Mm -hmm. She described that experience like l winning the lottery. The same afternoon we heard from another woman who had uh, uh, left her home uh, because she could no longer support her children. So the children's father had moved in. This woman was couch surfing, staying with friends because she was basically homeless. Her perception of her community was to view it through the eyes of where will I sit during the day when I'm homeless? Oh. So th those, you know, the gamut from hope to despair yeah. uh, were, uh, you know, present in, in the day. Wow, wow. Michael? Yeah, I want to say that sure. um, I think that my own tradition represents a, a great number of new immigrants to Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pressures that many new immigrants to Canada have um, is, 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 can be. Uh, a, a highway to poverty 
you know, joblessness, um, credentialing, um, don't know the system, don't speak the language. And all of those factors can really impact on new immigrant communities, on the ability to find work, and as a result, move themselves along mm -hmm. uh, uh, to pros prosperity. Mm -hmm. and, and poverty, is, it, it seems like um, poverty is, is like a barking dog on the heels of, of, of new immigrants to Canada, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And, and, and if not for this paycheck, I might be on the street. Yep. And then yep. the, the things that we talk about as a result of poverty, you know, um, nutrition, you know, ability to get food, and mm -hmm. that impacts on, on, on ability to study, ability to, to exceed in school, to excel in sports, to, you know, to do the things that, 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 that contributes towards a society, as well as one own well-being. You know, and, 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 and this, the, the specter, the looming specter of poverty, you know, is a, is a wide-ranging, ever-threatening kind of thing that, that I think that we all need to, to work to eradicate within our society, yeah. for sure. Uh, on, exactly. on, that, on that same yeah. point, I think it's quite interesting that one of the amazing things we found through the social audit process mm -hmm. is that it really started to open up the minds, and I heard from some of the rapporteurs and conveners that I've talked to, that the amazing aspect or the amazing process of sort of talking to real people about their real lived experience of poverty is started to really help people to break down their stereotypes of what is a poor person. Yeah, that's right. And I think that a lot of the yeah. political pro programs that are put together by politicians in terms of economic recovery programs and employment recovery programs, it's looking at people as saying that they're living in poverty because they just need to work harder and get a job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think that what we find through the social audit process is talking to people, as you're mentioning, Michael, whether they're newcomers or people who have been born here, there are certain challenges that are put in front of people. There may be illnesses, accidental mental health issues or others that prevent people from having the system that needs to support them to actually move and sort of live above the poverty line, sure. right? And so those, those programs need to be formed in a way that have a different definition of what is a poor person. Yeah. What, do they, yeah. Yeah. what do they live, what is their lived experience like? Sure, right? and we have new immigrants, Michael, as you suggest, who are very well educated in the countries from which they come, but when they arrive here, end up in jobs that are, you know, not giving them the dignity of their profession, if you will. I mean, I recently uh, drove in a cab here in Toronto with a gentleman who had a doctorate degree in history and couldn't find well, a job. And, and this is the contradiction because a lot of the application that's uh, the process is that uh, people are let into the country who have these uh, sort of higher education, yeah. but once they get here, they're not uh, even, it's not even recognized. That's right. So there's exactly. a contradiction that we're presenting, I think, to the rest of the world in terms of our own immigration policy. Exactly. 